This is a continuation of the lectures on stresses on faults and fractures. In this lecture, we're going to see how to use the Mohr circle in order to determine what is the shear and the normal stress on a fault in three dimensions. And we are going to use the 3D Mohr circle. All right, so this is section 5.4. I'm just going to click in here and we'll go to the first figure. The general idea behind this problem is, as I was saying before, uh, for a an element or in general uh, any place and they're given stress conditions of horizontal stresses and vertical stress and for a plane oriented at an arbitrary orientation with a given strike and dip, we would like to determine what is the shear stress on that plane, which means parallel to that plane, and what is the normal stress, the stress component normal to that plane, so we can get to know if the fault is under stable or unstable conditions. In the previous chapters, we saw that we can get to know what is the ideal orientation of the fault or what would be the maximum stress that a, a given place uh, could uh, support given that it is faulted, uh, the relation sigma one equal to Q sigma three. Well, in this case, we're going to open up this discussion to a, a little bit of a more general case in which we could have a fault which is not necessarily ideally oriented, but it could be at any orientation. And for that particular fault, we would like to see how the stress conditions are at that particular place. Okay, so uh, in order to get into this analysis, we'll go by steps. Before jumping into the case of an arbitrary strike and dip resulting in a plane which does not coincide with any of the principal stresses uh, direction, then uh, we're going to start with a simpler case. And let me move a little bit down uh, very slowly. Uh, this is going to be the case that I have in blue over here. So the first thing we're going to, to see is what will be the stresses on planes, like this blue one over here, that result of a combination of sigma v and sigma h min. And that will be a plane that goes from the plane of sigma v to the plane of uh, sigma uh, h min. And you could think that, as we have been doing before, imagine a plane in which the, there is a hinge here in the strike line for this particular case. And it could be that angle beta one could be zero, and zero would be the vertical stress, or it could be 90. And that angle then would be this uh, hidden side of the cube in the back, which will coincide with sigma h min. So let's see how that applies to the 3D Mohr circle. Well, for beta one equal to zero, that would mean that our stress is going to be sigma v, and it's going to be this plane over here. For this particular location, the place in the Mohr circle is the place of the principal stress sigma v, and it's a point uh, right here where I am moving the mouse. If beta one is equal to 90 degrees, then we'll go all, all, all the way to the back plane, which is subjected to the stress, which is equal to sigma h min, which is a point over here. And everything in between for beta one that goes from zero to 90 degrees are going to be state of stresses that are on this blue circle. For example, for beta one equal to 45 degrees in the Mohr circle, we have to multiply that times two. So that's going to be a point right over here. 45 times two, that's going to be 90. This is that point. This is the point of the maximum shear stress, but not necessarily of the maximum shear to effective normal stress ratio, which is this point over here. We'll get back to this uh, later on. But the blue circle, that's the overall message, it represents all the possible combinations of normal stress and shear stress for 
these planes that are a combination of sigma v and sigma h mean with beta 1 that goes from 0 to 90. Notice for all those planes, whatever is the value of beta 1, those planes are going to be collinear with sigma h max, or sigma h max direction is going to coincide with the direction of the plane. So if you were, for example, to try to decompose what is sigma h max on that plane, uh, there uh, wouldn't be any a, a shear component uh, on that because they have uh, the same direction. You could also think that in a different, slightly different way. Sigma b, it's applied on this uh, hanging wall and it will move it down. Sigma h mean is going to resist of the movement of this hanging wall if it were to move and is going to oppose it, to it. But it does have a projection on the blue plane. Uh, however, there is no projection of this intermediate stress on that plane, which means that it's not adding any component of, uh, of shear or uh, normal stress, while the other ones, uh, they, they do have that component. So if I were, if I wanted to, for example, to calculate what is the shear stress and effective normal stress for beta 1 equal to 45 degrees, all I would do is to pick the blue circle and go a magnitude 2 beta 1, uh, which in this case would be 90 degrees over there in the circle. And just by uh, knowing uh, what is the coordinate of this point, I will be able uh, to calculate that. And what is going to be the coordinate of that point? Uh, that's very simple. If we know what the center of the circle is and what the radius of the circle is, uh, we're going to get it right from there. For example, for the apex of this circle, the coordinate x is the center of the circle, and the coordinate y is equal to the radius of the circle. What is the center of the circle? Is the average of sigma h mean and sigma v, or sigma h mean plus sigma v divided by 2. And the radius of the circle is the half of the diameter. Sigma v minus sigma h mean divided by 2, that's the radius of the circle. And that will be the value of the shear stress. In general, uh, that equation, uh, here we have one example. Uh, for the normal stress, uh, we're going to have that this is going to be equal to the, let me write that in a separate equation. Let me come back over here. So in the general case, this is going to be for any more circle. that in which we're interested in getting to know what is the shear and the effective normal stress. If this is the Mohr circle, any circle is going to have a center. Any circle is going to have a radius. And if we want to get to know what are the coordinates in this particular location, all that we have to do is to compute those and this is going to be 2 beta 1 and therefore sigma n now this is going to be equal to the center of the circle plus the radius of the circle times the projection of that radius on the x-axis, which in this case is the cosine of 2 beta 1. And the shear stress is just going to be equal to the radius of the circle projected on the vertical axis. And that's equal to sine of 2 beta 1. Where, let's say, that this is uh, sigma 3 in Roman numbers and sigma 1. This is going to apply to any circle. So you don't have to uh, use the maximum and the minimum principal stress. It's going to apply any circle. But I just want to make a case here that 
for these two equations, the center is simply the average of the two stresses you are considering, and the radius is going to be half of the diameter or the difference in these two. So just by remembering this equation, which is, it just come right straight out of this uh, geometrical problem, you can calculate affecting normal stress and shear stress at any point. So let's come back over here. Then by using this equation, I could tell what is the shear and affecting normal stress anywhere in this blue circle. And that would represent all the planes that have a hinge along the strike line in this particular case, for an angle beta 1 that goes from 0 to 90. OK, in this case, we have used the planes of sigma v and the plane of sigma h1. Let's go to the following case. Now we'll, let's use the plane of sigma v and the plane of sigma h uh, max, uh, before we use the one of sigma h min. So now we use sigma v and sigma h max. And let's imagine that we have a hinge in this plane that goes from the plane of sigma v to the plane of sigma h ma max, but this one the, on the hidden side that we can't see. It's, it's the same. And beta 2 also goes from 0 to 90. At beta 2 equal to 0, the normal stress is going to be equal to sigma v, and the shear stress is going to be equal to 0, because this is a principal stress, so that point over here. A beta 2 equal to 90, I'm getting to this hidden phase, or which is the same, this other phase, in which the normal stress is sigma h max, that point over here, and the shear stress is also 0 because it is a principal stress. And anything in between is the red circle that you see over here. Uh, same as before beta 2, let's say 45 degrees, this point over here. How do you calculate for a particular angle? You use the same equations that uh, we have over here, but now you use, as for the stresses, or the center and the radius of the circle, you use sigma v and sigma h max. But those are the exact same equations. But now you have an angle uh, beta 2. And let's do the third possible case. Uh, it would be a combination of the plane that goes from the plane of sigma h max to the plane of sigma h min with a hinge here on this vertical line. There is something very important to know this and to remember for to use this more circle so you always keep using the same equations. Always this angle beta is going to be measured from the plane of the maximum stress of the two that you are considering at that particular time to the plane of the uh, minimum stress. So the, the, uh, the higher to the lower stress. In the previous two cases, in this particular example of normal faulting, sigma v was the largest. So we measured beta 1 and beta 2 from the plane of sigma v. But notice now that we go to the horizontal stresses, we need to measure the angle beta from the plane of sigma h max. All right, so if, if beta is equal to 0, then uh, the effective normal stress is sigma h max, the shear stress is 0, and it's this point over here. If the angle beta 3 is equal to 90, I'm getting into this phase, and the effective normal stress is sigma h min, and the shear stress is 0. And everything in between is going to be this red circle and those possible st uh, state of stresses uh, that are going to go from beta 3 from 0 to 90. So uh, let's try to summarize all of these. These three lines, the red, the blue, and the green, they represent all the possible 
state of stress, or combinations of shear stress and effective normal stress for planes that are oriented either uh, with this blue orientation, the green, or the red. Notice that all those planes, they at least have one of the directions that coincides with the plane itself. In this example, it's sigma h max. Here in the middle is sigma h min. And here in the right is sigma v. In all those cases, there is one of the principal stresses which is not contributing to the projection of stress uh, on the plane. And what that means is that these three circles, they are representing just a subset of all the possible cases. And they, they are representing all those cases in which at least one of the principal stresses coincides with the plane. If some of those planes uh, for a particular fault or a particular fracture does not coincide with one of the direction of principal stresses, then you will have something like this, something which is called an oblique uh, fault or an oblique uh, fracture that doesn't coincide with any of those principal stresses. And those planes are going to have a shear stress and effective normal stress that is going to be within this shaded area, within the three circles. So um, there are methods in order to solve this geometrically, similar to what I have done with beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3, but we're not going to solve them geometrically because it's actually uh, quite difficult, takes a long time, and we have a better method to do that mathematically. So, so we're not going to do it, but it's very important conceptually, as we're going to see later on, that you know that everything inside the three circles represents the possible state of stress, tau and sigma n of faults or fractures which are not aligned with the principal stresses. Okay, so I like that you learn how to calculate a shear stress and a normal stress for these particular cases in which at least one of the stresses coincides with the plane that you are interested in, and it may not be necessarily the plane of the maximum shear stress, like the one that we saw before that would require this characteristic angle beta to be 45 degrees plus a friction angle divided by 2. We're now expanding this knowledge, and we are interested also into angles that might not be uh, 45 plus the friction angle divided by 2. All right, so let's see how we do that. Uh, here we have one example problem. Uh, we need to find what is the shear and effective normal stress on a fault plane under the, the following state of stress conditions and, and for a given fault orientation. So in this case, this is a fault which is striking north-south, has a dip of uh, 60 degrees. Uh, it doesn't say in this case it is towards the east or toward, towards the west because uh, it's going to be the same for the solution. And I know what is the state of stress. I know what is the value of the total vertical stress, the value of the total maximum horizontal stress, the value of the total minimum horizontal stress, and also very important, I know what is the direction of the minimum principal stress, which is horizontal, and in this case, is at 90 degrees. So that means it's going to go in direction east-west. And I also know the pore pressure. Something very important that this reminds me to tell you is that you should always draw these more circles in effective stresses not in total stresses. Why? Because when we draw the more circle with effective stresses, we can draw also the failure line. Otherwise, uh, we cannot do that. So whenever you get your total stresses and your pore pressure, the first thing that you should do is to subtract that pore pressure and, and work with effective total stresses. Okay, so 
let's see how we solve this problem. And uh, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to build uh, and draw a cube similar to the ones that we have on the top. And we're going to see what is the particular fault that I'm asked to solve what is the shear and normal stress on that fault. All right, so let's see the solution. Uh, the first thing I would do would be to draw here uh, the geographical coordinate system. Uh, you can see it right, right here. I know what the total stresses are, vertical, horizontal, in direction east-west. That's something that I was told over here. And also the maximum horizontal stress on the pore pressure. After that, I would make a more circle diagram in which I use effective stresses. So subtracting pore pressure from these total stresses, I'm going to have here 13 megapascals of effective vertical stress. I'm going to have 10 megapascals of effective horizontal maximum stress and 3.8 megapascals of horizontal minimum effective stress. Okay, the second thing after I do this, and this is the same uh, cube, would be to find this particular fault. All right, this particular fault has a strike of zero, which means north-south, and that's the line of strike. And it has a dip of 60 degrees. And uh, in this case, I drew this one going towards the east. So this angle is 60 degrees, the real angle of dip. OK, how do I take that to the Mohr circle? Well, if this is a plane that appears to be a plane that results from a combination of this plane sigma v and sigma h min with a hinge on this line, then the Mohr circle I need is a Mohr circle that combines sigma v and sigma h min. And that Mohr circle is this one, the ones that go from 13.8 for, uh, the, it goes from 13 uh, megapascals for sigma v to 3.8 megapascals for sigma h min, which is this point over here. And if I want to get to know what is the shear stress and the effective normal stress at this particular fault, I will have to go two times this angle counterclockwise from the point of sigma v, which is that angle. 2 times 60 is going to be 120. This is the state of stress of this particular uh, fault. And using the equations that we saw before, sigma n is going to be the center of the circle, which is the average of these two effective stresses, plus the radius of the circle times the cosine of 260. And the shear is going to be the coordinate y, which is just the radius of the circle times the sine of 260. Notice something interesting here. In this case, uh, center plus the radius times the cosine of the angle, uh, you should notice that it's going to be that point X coordinate is going to be somewhere over here. And you're capturing the subtraction of this length from the center to here because the cosine of 120 is going to be a negative number. So when this is going to be a negative number, then to the center, you're going to subtract the projection of the radius on the x axis. So that's taken care of by the equation itself. So make sure that, that you do not mix that. Here it was. It should always be positive, and here you just use an angle that goes uh, from a total of zero from 180 degrees, which would mean your actual angle of your fault going from zero to 90 degrees. And here there is uh, another example that uh, has conditions which are a little bit different. Uh, now my stresses are not aligned with the north uh, and the south or the east and the west. 
So doing a, a 3D plot or a 3D cube, it's, it's a little bit challenging. Instead, what we're going to do is to do a top view, okay? And for this particular case, let's see our fault has an azimuth uh, on a strike that is 60 degrees from the north towards the east. So this is that strike, the blue one, the blue line is the fault. And also I know that the stresses uh, are going to be maximum, uh, in this case, vertical stress is going to be 30 megapascal total. Maximum horizontal is going to be 45 megapascal total. And the minimum principal stress is going to be 25 megapascal total, which means that in this case, we are under strike slip conditions because 45 is the maximum. And also I have a port pressure of 15. And notice also that the direction of the minimum principal stress is uh, 25 megapascals, the minimum horizontal total stress. And just a reminder, azimuth is the angle from the north towards the particular line you're considering. So that means that in this case, SH mean is at 30 degrees from the north towards the east. So is this angle over here. All right, so uh, let's see uh, how we solve this problem. Uh, this one is a little bit more difficult than the one before. So le let me work it from scratch. It's just going to take one minute. You just need to be very, a little bit careful drawing, uh, the same as as we, we did before with some of the some of the drawings of faults. And if I wanted to solve this particular problem, I would do the following uh, drawing. First, I will start by drawing the, the cube in which I'm going to apply the stresses. If I know that, that this is the north and this is the east, I'm going to take this to a bigger scale. And here I'm being told that the minimum principal stress is going to be 30 degrees from the north towards the east. Then the second thing I'm going to do is to look for that direction. And let's say this is 30 degrees. If this is the direction of SH mean, that means that perpendicular to that, I'm going to have the direction of SH max. So a line perpendicular to this one is going to be a line somewhere over here. And this is going to be the direction of SH max. Remember, a fundamental condition of a principal stress is that they are perpendicular to each other. So this is going to be the direction of SH max. And my block that I'm going to consider is going to be a block like this with the principal stresses apply normal to these surfaces. And let me erase these lines that I used before. This angle is going to be 30 degrees. And the next thing I would do is to locate uh, my fault. And this particular fault we were saying it's going to have a dip of 90 degrees and this oriented 60 degrees from the north towards the east. So it's going to be this line over here, which in the plot I was making before is going to be, let me do it with another color. If this is 30, 
and 60 degrees from the north towards the east is going to be a line more or less somewhere over here. This is the fault. And since this is a top view and this one is a, a vertical a vertical fault, I, I don't draw the deep uh, or I don't put any, any number for the deep. Remember the geological symbol for this, it would be something like this. All right, uh, so the next thing is going to be to take this to the 3D Morse circle. And what I have to do is first to recognize what are the stresses that are contributing to this particular uh, fault, what are the stresses that are going to project on this fault plane. And as you can see, sigma v is uh, perpendicular to the plane of the drawing and it's not going to project on the fault. The ones that are going to project are going to be sigma h max and sigma h min. So what I'm going to have to do is for the Mohr circle, the only two stresses I need are going to be sigma h max and sigma h min. I don't need sigma v, sigma v because sigma v or sv is on the plane of the fold itself. So let me come back over here. Uh, this is a similar drawing, just a little bit smaller. Uh, the two stresses I need are sigma h max and sigma h min. Sigma h max is 45 MPa minus the pore pressure. That's going to give me 30 megapascals of effective stress, normal stress. Sigma h min minus the pore pressure of 15 megapascals. That's going to give me 10 megapascals of effective stress. And I now need the angle going from the plane of sigma h max to the plane of sigma h min. Let me do it in the previous drawing so that it's a little bit better. Uh, now I need to go uh, from to find the angle that goes from the plane of the maximum stress to the plane of the minimum stress for the two stress I'm considering. And in this case, this plane, I hope that you can see, is going to be uh, the maximum, the plane of maximum stress is going to be SH max, and the one of minimum stress is sigma H min. And that would be like having a hinge. Let me extend just this for the sake of just using a hinge uh, which is on the same uh, on the same line of the drawing, the line of my drawing. If I were to extend these two lines as imaginary lines, the hinge will be vertical and will be right there. And the angle to go from the plane of sigma h max, which is the maximum stress I'm considering, this one over here, uh, to the plane of the minimum stress for that particular case is going to be this angle and this angle is equal to uh, 30 degrees. Why, why is this 30 degrees? Because notice that this is a right angle and this is 60 degrees because it is the opposite angle uh, to this one and uh, because they have to add up to 90, uh, this is just uh, 30 degrees. So 30 degrees is our angle, our angle that we need to multiply times two in order to go to the Mohr circle. And if we go over here, uh, that's what you need. Two times 30 is going to be equal to 60. This is the point in the Mohr circle that you're looking for. And this point is the one that represents that particular fault over there. So if you want to know what is the shear stress and the normal stress on that fault, then you need to use the equations, sigma n center plus the radius times cosine of 230. That's going to go to give you something which is something like close to 20, uh, 25. You see the result over here, right? But it's just coordinate y at this position and uh, coordinate x at this position. And for the shear stress, it's just going to be the coordinate y 
at this position, which in this case is 8.7 MPa. So remember, for all these particular cases in which at least one of the stresses coincides with the plane of the fault, you just use this simple method and you recognize which of these three circles you have to use in order to solve that particular problem. You're going to see in the homework that there is a problem related to this, and it's problem number uh, problem number uh, five. Yes, problem number five, and you have four cases for all for the same state of stress. These are different faults in the same place for which we would like to calculate what is the shear and the normal stress component. Uh, but you will find that there is one of those that does not align with one of the principal stresses. That's going to be an oblique fault, and you cannot solve it with this method that I just showed uh, before. This one just seem is uh, useful for cases in which at least one of the stresses is collinear with one of the planes. And uh, just for so solving it, uh, by hand, this is all I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you to solve oblique cases uh, whenever uh, you, you have these oblique faults. I'm just going to ask you for cases in which uh, the planes at least coincide with one of the principal stresses, which are going to be located on these circles, the blue, the red, or the green. So the question is now, what happens inside? How do we calculate? shear stress and normal stress when we are inside these three circles. All right, so uh, as I was saying before, you can do that uh, geometrically, but it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite a long procedure, and we have an alternative method to solve that, which is not geometric, but it involves uh, a little bit more of advanced uh, linear algebra. And this is called the tensor method. I like that you know what this method is about, but you, I'm not asking you to get to know how to use it or how to apply it. If you are interested in this and you want to do it on your own, uh, I can help you with it. Uh, actually, I have a problem in the homework, which is optional. You can do it if you want, but if you don't want to do it, just don't do it. Uh, I'm just asking you for the concepts behind this tensor method. All right, let's see what this tensor method is about. In the tensor method, what we do is we write the principal stress tensor, which is a matrix, in the coordinate system in which we have the north, the east, and the down directions. So any principal stress matrix with the maximum principal stress in the direction of the maximum direction and the minimum principal stress in the direction of the minimum direction, uh, that's going to be a matrix. But that matrix, uh, whatever its orientation is, whether it's a stress, uh, one of the stresses vertical or not, can be written in the geographical coordinate system by doing a matrix transformation. This matrix transformation is explained uh, over here. And it depends on what is the orientation of the axis of those principal directions with respect to the geographical coordinate system. So uh, if you know what these alpha, beta, and gamma angles are, you can build this transformation matrix, which is just a change of coordinate system. And you can calculate what is that geographical stress tensor based on the principal stress tensor. Once you have that, uh, that's we are halfway of solving the problem. Uh, we know what the stress tensor in geographical coordinates is. The second thing to do is to project that stress tensor on the local coordinate system of the fault. What is the local coordinate system of the fault? Is the one that is composed by deep strike and normal vectors. And this goes by the name of uh, the DSN 
coordinate system where D is for the dip, S for strike, and uh, N is for normal. If you notice, this is also a right-handed coordinate system. The first component is dip, so that would be your index finger, which in this case is pointing down towards the southeast. The middle finger will be the strike, which in this case is on the horizontal plane, and it's pointing north in northeast uh, direction. And your thumb of your right hand always is going to be the normal direction. And that's uh, going to be the coordinate system of the fault. Do you remember that in the previous lecture I told you about the strike, that sometimes the actual value of the strike will depend, on, will depend on the direction of the dip? Here you have the reason. The strike angle is going to be the angle between the north and the vector component of the strike. And you may imagine how this strike is going to vary if the dip, instead of uh, going in direction southeast, like in this case, would be on the opposite direction, going direction northwest, then this strike would be pointing in this direction, now towards the southwest. And the strike will be this amount plus 180 degrees. And just as an example, let's see uh, how this will look on the stereo net. Uh, this fault is that one, right? More or less the same. And here we see the pole of the of the fault. And over here we see what is the strike and uh, what is the the dip. So in this case, uh, just try to do this with me as you watch the video. Uh, you could put your index finger going down in the direction of the dip. That's going to be the, the dip uh, vector. Your middle finger is going to go in the direction of the strike, and your thumb is going to be perpendicular to those two. And that's going to give you a strike of 30 degrees, which is what you see over here. In this case, 54 is the dip. While if you had the opposite, let me come back to 2D over here. If you had a fault somewhere over here, now I'm going to be looking at this one over here. Now, if your uh, deep uh, vector is going down deep, is going to go in direction north-west, uh, now your strike finger is going to be pointing in direction southeast, which is your middle finger. And that's why the angle of the strike now is over 180 degrees, and it's 209, because now it is this angle from here to there. OK. So uh, once we define that, we can also build a matrix for this particular coordinate system, or we just can multiply by the vector. But at the end of the day, I'm going to be able to multiply these matrices times the vectors that tell us the orientation of that fault with respect to the geographical coordinate system. And with that, I'm going to be able to compute uh, with a series of uh, a matrix time vector product and then dot products, which are projections either on the normal direction or in the deep direction, or the strike direction. I'm going to be able to calculate the normal stress or the shear stresses either in the deep direction or in the strike direction. And the total shear stress is going to be a vectorial summation of those two. And by doing those operations, I can calculate what is the value of the normal stress and the shear stress for all those planes that may not be aligned with uh, one of the directions of principal stresses. Of course, this method is also going to work for those cases that we saw before, uh, but it's also going to work for the cases that we couldn't solve before. And here you have some examples of application, how to use this. Uh, again, uh, you don't have to do it, 
but if you are a little bit bored now and you want to, to try this and do a little bit of lead, uh, linear algebra, matrix multiplications and for loops, uh, this is an excellent problem uh, to work with. Okay, so this ends this particular topic and uh, with, uh, with uh, this topic also we finish with the basic and fundamental concepts about faults, ideal orientation, stresses on faults. Uh, in the following section we'll see how to apply this knowledge to reservoir geomechanics.